beautiful, the National Park of Dartmoor in Devon. Legendary throughout the world where millions of visitors return each year to soak up its magic and grace its hills and valleys. A generation comes and goes, but Dartmoor remains unchanged, a jewel in paradise despite its bleakness and at times unconquerable tours due to the treacherous winters with blankets of snow and howling sub-zero winds. Whilst the beauty of summer is hard to describe, it is as if the moor had always been there, beckoning and inviting, a bleak silence that brings life into perspective. But our story is a sad one, for no longer does the smell of the smoke and the distant bark of prairie tanks echo through the tors and valleys of the moor. The old GWR branch, Yelverton to Princetown, is no more, now just a distant memory of the past. 133 years of steam transportation closed as a result of balance sheet deficits by British Rail Western Region in 1956. Though gone, the line had a rich history, from stories of convicts escorted to the prison at Princetown to the emergency services sent out to rescue trains stranded in the snowbound tours of winter's past. Running from Yelverton to Princetown, the train had to circumnavigate ten and a half miles, negotiating some of the most treacherous climbs in England with a ruling gradient of one in forty. Particularly was this the case in the winter months, yet according to engineers, and despite frozen rails in the heart of winter, it was rare to encounter slipping of any kind. Leaving Yelverton, the line headed out towards the little village of Dowsland. From there it twisted on towards the great lake of Burrator, where the station of Burrator and Sheep Store Halt was perched high on a bank overlooking the reservoir. Onwards then, and a climb to the summit and lonely station of Ingrator Halt, perched at the top of the incline. Across Wolkhampton Common in an easterly direction to Kingtor Halt. And finally, into Princetown itself, the terminus. From Plymouth's main station, the train would have headed out towards Tavistock Junction and into Marsh Mills, following the track then through Plimbridge Platform, on to Bickley, then Shaw Prior, Clearbrook Halt, and finally into Yelverton, the junction station for the Princetown line. The layout of Yelverton Station, although small, was relatively complicated as country stations go. The track ran straight through, running south in the down direction and on into the tunnel beyond. Halfway up the platform stood the building housing, the ticket office and waiting rooms. A 35 lever signal box controlled the rail traffic. In this view of the station, the turntable can be seen with the inspection pit and road but the turntable was not used to turn engines. Its function was reserved for snowplough activity during the treacherous winter weather. The Princetown branch platform was reached from points leading off the uploop just north of the island platform. The engine usually returned from Princetown bunker first and the method of changing ends at Yelverton was by a runaround employing gravity procedure. A train headed by engine 4568 is seen here arriving from Dowsland. The engine is decoupled from the carriages and tucked away in the spur. The road now clear, the signal off, and the guard allows the coaches to run back into the platform under their own steam, as it were. And with the spur road clear, the engine runs back to pick up the coaches for the outward journey. A 44-class tank and two coaches forming the usual branch train stand in their platform waiting for the off. And as the train moves slowly out of the station, it faced a steep climb on a rising gradient of 1 in 40. 
The scenery suddenly opened up at this point to green fields bordered by the River Meavy and backed by the Alderwood Plantation as the journey passed through the scattered environs of Yelverton. In a northeasterly direction, the train then headed towards the Grattan Cross area, negotiating two iron bridges, the first over the Yelverton to Cornwood Road and the second over the Yelverton to Meavy thoroughfare. Away to the southeast and just over a mile distant lay the village of Meavy with its royal oak in which King Charles I was said to have hidden away from his rounded adversaries during the turbulent days of the Civil War. After a half a mile, the embankment gave way to a deepening cutting running below the eastern suburbs of Yelverton. At a point where Sethella Road ran parallel to the line, the now disused Plymouth and Devonport Leet crossed the line by means of two large iron aqueducts standing on granite legs. In addition, a right of way into the fields on the eastern side of the line was provided for by three arch accommodation bridge. All bridges and viaducts have now been demolished and the track bed completely filled in. Leaving the suburbs of Yelverton, the journey then ran parallel with the main Yelverton to Princetown Road as the train approached Dowsland Station. This was a picturesque country station with a curved platform on the downside constructed of stone filling faced with brick. The signal box at the eastern end of the platform was uniquely toy-like in appearance, with its windows often decorated with geraniums. It had a 14-lever frame with only one spare lever and bore the unusual nameplate in cast iron Dowsland Barn signal box. Though a small country station, Dowsland had its own good shed with a small platform leading to a loading bay by the road. There was a coal store parallel to the facing side of the passing loop. As the line progressed eastward, its curvature increased as it crossed over the level crossing passing the brick-built cement-rendered ground frame controlling the crossing gates. North of the gate stood Station Cottage, which still survives to this day, but known as Crossings Cottage. Here loco number 4410 waits with the 11.19am from Yelverton and an up train from Princetown negotiates the level crossing in May of 1953. Once the level crossing was negotiated, the train entered a small, shallow cutting running southwards parallel with the Walkhampton Meavy Road through the village of Dowsland. At the two-mile post, a second level crossing was encountered. Prouse's crossing at a small side road to give access to the lower slopes of Yenadon Down. It was once the entrance to the old Yenadon iron mine, but now serves private housing. After Prouse's crossing, the line took up a more southeasterly course as it emerged into the open gorse-strewn slopes of Yenadon Down. At this stage of the journey, passengers could look down from their train at the valley of the Meavy, with commanding views of Bowden's plantation and Flatwood on the other side of the river and Burritor Wood on the other. At two miles and 72 chains, it made its final run into Burrator and Sheepstor Halt, high above the Great Lake of Burrator. This heavy timber platform was supported on trestle legs with cross members. Concrete posts carrying a steel rail and several steel wires formed the back, whilst a totally out of portion wooden name board with cast iron lettering announced its name. At the south end of the platform stood a wooden waiting room. A kissing gate stood either end of the track. The one on the top side led to the footpath across Yenadon Down and the lower via rough-hewn steps down the dam. Further away to the west lies the moorland village of Sheepstor with its ancient granite church. From this position, passengers could enjoy breathtaking views of the area with its granite tours. And since World War II and into the late 1960s, there stood a steel lattice framework of the RAF Sharpator radio station. It served as a most confusing landmark to railway travellers on the branch for the torturous meanderings of the Princetown branch over and around the many tours gave sightings of this mast first from one side of the train, then to the other. Leaving Burrator and Sheepstor Halt, 
The line ran into a belt of conifers planted as a water catchment and protection for the nearby reservoir. At Lowry Crossing, with its keeper's cottage and manned until 1927, the gates were permanently closed in favour of the train. If no warning bells operated by the train were audible, motorists were responsible to open and close the gates as required. At three and three quarter miles out of Yelverton, the train continued on its climb on a one in 41 gradient towards the open moor. From the woods and running on a steepening embankment, the line then crossed the B3212 by means of the granite Peak Hill Bridge. From this bridge, warders from Dartmoor Prison used to stand, using it as a vantage point during a convict breakout. From the bridge, passengers could see the Walkham Valley with its river flowing past the village of Walkhampton, and towards the rest, Horror Bridge, the original junction station for the Princetown Line. In the far distance was the area of West Devon, dominated by the 13th century church of St Michael de Roop, perched on the summit of Brentor. From flat open moorland, the train then headed for Ingratore, following the line around Leedentor some 1277 feet above sea level. The views from Ingratore Holt on a hot summer's day were and still are exhilarating. Pew Tor and Vixen Tor beyond the river, Staples Tor, nearby King Tor's Rocky Crown, and the wide sweep of North Hessery Tor, where the BBC television mast is still located. Not unlike Burrator, Ingra Torholt was a platform wholly constructed of wood with a white painted shelter standing at its rear. The platform stood on wooden trestle legs. A small white gate led out into the moor past the famous snake notice and in doing so gave access to the door of the waiting room shelter. Two posts carrying lamp frames were lit by the guard on the 4pm evening train from Princeton whilst the guard on the 7pm from Yelverton, that's the last train of the day, retrieved the oil lamps for refilling and replacing the following day. Leaving Ingra Torholt, the train continued across Walkhampton Common in an easterly direction to make a wide sweep around Yestor at six and a half miles from Yelverton. At the seven mile point, a nine mile post lay adjacent although 200 feet apart in a higher northeasterly direction. The two points were connected with a grass road which linked King Torholt, the next stop. The lonely station here was constructed with gravel-topped earthworks, finished and edged at the line side with timber. Fencing ran along the back of the platform and the two lamp stands stood either end, devoid of any oil lamps during the daytime. Now at the nine mile stage, the train headed southeast then due east until it ran parallel with the main B3212 road from Yalverton to Princetown to the south of the line and its final run into the Princetown terminus. Princetown station itself was a rather drab grey place and even on a fine day after a glorious climb up from Yalverton, arrival there was considered to be an anticlimax to an otherwise memorable journey. Its layout was a running line through the station with a very long loop alongside, off which at the far end was a short facing siding with cattle pens. The layout included an engine shed, water crane and coal storage reversing onto a shorter turntable road. Passengers alighting here made their way out to the confines of the station through the main building into Station Road, thus ending their journey. While Eric Thomas operated the signal box at Yelverton Station, guard Ken Gay was all set for the run to Princeton, a journey he took on numerous occasions. The train to Lanson, train to Plymouth, and, and the Princeton train used to connect with up and down trains. Freight on a Monday, on a Wednesday, and a Friday from Princeton to Orrebridge. And then they would pick up coal and cattle food at Orrebridge and take to Princeton. 
Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. We would put coal off there. That was a, a fairly popular coal depot. We used to put coal off there every every three days of the week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and pick up the opens that were empty on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays for them to go to Arbridge to be taken back to Plymouth. But it was just fields and woods, nothing else. There were a few odd bungalows either side of the track, but no way a built-up area as it is now. And then you would go up through the woods and come out onto the open moor approaching Borator. Engine driver Bill Goff and fireman Cyril Stevens are featured in this archive footage. But another driver, Ron Sargent, worked on the lines for a few weeks and remembers it well. Great Western had, had enough experience, didn't they? They, they, they'd, they'd sorted all these troubles out years ago as regards to slipping <coughs> with engines. The, these 45s that went up a branch, the, the sand worked perfectly on them, didn't it? And uh, as soon as the driver felt that the engine was going to slip, he just drop a bit of sand and that was it, the way any end you would go, it was, it was no problem at all, was it? They, they never had the, the problems on branches, uh, you never, it was unheard of for anyone to stick through slipping, wasn't it? Unheard of. Oh yes, I think that was about one of the, one of the well it was the most popular halt on the branch because of the view they got from the, from the halt looking down onto the dam. Very popular. We stopped there every trip. You had to in case people wanted to get out or people would join, but uh, in the winter it was very, very quiet. The farmhouse was um, near Ingratore, just off to the left of the moor, running towards Princeton, and uh, that's where Joan French and her brothers used to live. She was a regular traveller. The farmhouse where she lived was uh, quite a little way from the, from the halt, but she would walk from the farmhouse to the track and walk a little way down the track to join the halt because that was the only way she could get there. They used to go to Princeton to do their shopping and once a week they would go to Tavistock, usually on a Friday because that was market day. Two lamp standers at Ingratore, both oil fed lanterns which were brought down by the guard of the train as it got dark in the winter or in the summer we didn't didn't need them and they would be taken out on the last trip and taken back to Princeton. It was just a, a thing that you always brought up to do, like, you know, open doors, shut doors, generally look after the passengers. The boys that used to come from at that time, you should travel on the train. They were from Tavistock, the school, and they would come home on that, um, on the branch, the 10 to 5 train from Yelverton. And I have known them to get out at Ingrid Torault, and they would run across the moor, and by the time we got to King Torault, they would be waiting for the train. And that's quite some way across the moor. In the summer, yes, yeah, you'd be very popular for tourists. They used to go up and back just for the ride and perhaps get out at the alt and do a bit of filming and back on the train again and take a film of the train and these fanatics, you know. And, <laughs> and then um, they would return to Plymouth and pick up the train back to uh, where were they staying to. I never liked working on the 45 class England. Or the tanks always leaked for a start and uh, you could only stand up and you used to stand up with your, with your tummy up against the side and you always finish up by being leaking wet. But it, it wasn't hard work, but it it was interesting because you, you worked with men that 
were were on the branch regular, like you know, and, and they knew every every trick of the trade. They they knew it all, and uh, you you fitted in with them, like, you know, you you learned with them. The engines were never cold, never. No matter how cold it was outside, it was, it was always lovely and warm in the cab of a 45. The wires on the telegraph post would be the size of your arm because um, the fog that came down as well it w would freeze and that was known as the Hamel Frost. And the weight of the, of the ice on the wires would pull the poles down. I've seen that happen. I've been up there every morning went by the first train out of Princeton and the coupling of the coach or the engine then has been just one case, uh, one solid block of ice. But we had to break that up then with the, with the um, coal pick off the engine to get him up onto the coach to couple him up. I think the bus service went about once once a day. Of course, once the roads were bad, the buses weren't entertained at, at all. So the railway was the only communication between the outside world, if you like. I think it'd be very popular now if, if it had remained open, because they could have run um, diesel units over there without any cost as regards staffing, and uh, all they would have needed would have been a signalman at Yelverton to operate the points, Yelverton to Plymouth. I think at that time it, they intended to close all branch lines come what may, and, they, and they've done it, haven't they? they? They've closed all branch lines. As many branch lines as they possibly could close, they closed. Immaterial whether they paid or no. That's right, I agree. End story. Only a broken sign and 19th century boundary posts mark the sites of Princeton and Yelverton stations. On its very last day of working, in March 1956, guard Ken Gay had a special train. Well, it was a very sad day in one way because we knew that we were all going to split up possibly and go our different ways, although we all had jobs. But I came down with the last train from Princeton. And as we came down, we locked up the gates and uh, at the crossings, they were locked and padlocked, chained. That was the end of the line. Opening in 1880 to provide transport for the remote areas of Princeton, the Elverton to Princeton branch of the Great Western Railway passed close to Burrator Reservoir, and living in Yo Farm, just below the dam, was Ethel Bowden, a young girl at the time of the First World War. She vividly remembers one particular train. Yes, we were living in, in an isolated farmhouse during the end of the last, the First World War, and there was a rumour that the war was over. I, I had my two brothers and my fiancé in the war, and of course we were very anxious about them. And uh, we had no telephone or radio or anything like that. The only thing we had was a newspaper. And we arranged with the station master at Dowsland, who was a friend of ours, if it was true that the war was over, would he arrange with the engine driver on the Princetown Railway to blow a shrill blast just as the train was rounding the bend opposite our farmhouse. When the blast did go, there was great rejoicing at our farm. What could you do on an isolated farmhouse but jump in the air and clutch each other? <laughs> yes, it was a happy day. But the line was not profitable and closed in March of 1956. A driver who spent much of his working life on that railway was Reg Ball. When the railway was open first, there was Yelverton, Dowsland, 
Princeton. Eventually, smaller oats was opened, Bird or Oat, which was put up for the men who was building the extension of Bird or Some came from around Norbridge, Yelverton, who came up by train, and others was from Princeton coming down. For the convenience of traffic going across, there was a temporary suspension bridge, similar to the one that they got at Bristol, the Clifton Suspension Bridge. You can still see where the foundations, each side of the suspension bridge is still there now. Two concrete square places, as you see, one each side of, say, about 50 to 100 yards down from the main dam that is now. Eventually, they decided to close the Princeton branch. Visitors came there purposely for the view. More, it was about 50-50. See the view from going up, and the other 50% was to see the prison when they got there. I was one of the drivers they used to go up to bring away the sleepers and rails as they was taking it out. I went up on the last train. I didn't drive the last train. I rode up and had a ride back as the last trip over. I got a ticket. Still got the old railway ticket that I had to go up. More people patronized it that day than it was ever known. When they knew the thing was closed and they wouldn't have it no more, they wanted it. When they had it, they didn't want it. It's like everything. If you haven't got anything, you want it. In 1939, the runaround gravity procedure came to grief. The 4.50 p.m. to Princetown, headed by locomotive 4402 on the 25th of January, plunged over the bank after crashing through the buffers at the end of the spur. By light of day the following morning, a breakdown crane from Lera arrived to lift 4402 back onto the rails and into the depot for repairs. During the war years of 1939 to 1945, with some of the male station staff conscripted and called to arms, women began to join the branch staff. Joan Stevens and Joan Stacy to the right joined Messrs Stevens, Rendell, Brokenshire and Windsor for branch duties. And as well as their line duties from left to right, R. Windsor, F. Prowse, A. Stevens, C. Stevens and W. Goff take up their home guard duties. On Saturday the 3rd of March 1956, the line finally closed. The Ministry of Transport remained deaf to the many weeks of protestations, despite the fact that many objectors to the closure had presented convincing evidence of the lack of roads in the area. On the day of closure, Yelverton was besieged with cars as hundreds of people made the journey to Princeton and back for the last time. Two 45 tanks, number 4568 and 4583, headed the train drawing six coaches for Princeton, seen here on the Downs of Yenadon, and that was on the last day of working. Bill Goff and F. Coles were the enginemen that day, while Cyril Stevens and R. Hext were firemen. The guard was Ken Gay. Despite the unusual jovial approach, Members of the railway staff assembled to mark the very last passenger train leaving Princeton at 10.20pm. As early as October of 1956, the demolition contractors commenced work on the branch, which lasted into the following year. And during that time, all the track signalling and level crossing equipment was dismantled, almost as if it had never existed. On the 15th of October, a recovery train arrives at Princeton Station. Passing Kingtor platform with track fittings from Princeton around the same time. 
a trackless Lowry crossing in February of 1957. And here the track is lifted at Burrator in Sheep's Tor Halt. Dowsland Station and its track bed gradually disappear during February of 1957. The station at Yelverton survived the closing of the branch by seven years and by 1962 the Plymouth to Lunson branch had closed to all traffic. The site today is a nature reserve and by its very description it is overgrown and hardly a trace of the station remains. The land is strictly private as is the road in from the village. On the other hand, the site at Downsland Station has been partly restored to its former glory by the current householder there, who has purposely acquired reminders to show how the station used to be. At Burrator and Sheepstor Halt, there remains the stone base of the platform and the iron kissing gate that led down to the dam. The track bed is still evident and used by walkers and ramblers visiting the area. But no sign of the train. For many visitors, there is an unawareness that it ever existed. The Peak Hill Bridge is no more, only the granite truncated abutments remain, but the winding track bed towards Ingratore is still clearly visible. All that is left at Ingratore station site to remind visitors of the days of the steam era is the track bed used today by walkers and ramblers across the moor. It was not until 1960 that Princetown station buildings and site were removed and all that remains today are the GWR private road path signs at the end of the access points to the site. The days of steam are gone, and by the majority of those who venture Dartmoor's bleak and rugged land, forgotten. Despite rumblings of a reopening of a section of the line from Princetown to King Tor, it is unlikely that steam will ever again haunt the magnificent tours of Dartmoor. Although the railway is gone, time has left the old track bed almost perfectly intact. 
Today, as we face the turn of the century in the new millennium, there is a permanent reminder of the train journey from Yelverton to Princeton, which can be clearly seen from these unique aerial shots. Although in places the track bed has been obliterated by new housing, particularly at Dowsland, the majority of the track remains stubbornly ingrained, winding its way through the moor as a standing memory of what used to be. It accommodates those moorland walkers who, in their thousands each year, follow its twisting and turning, many oblivious of its origins. Come now, and let's take the journey and observe from the air and wonder how the train ever managed to navigate this barren and magnificent moor. And as the journey progresses, let's listen to the experiences of veteran passenger Victor Thompson of Barnstable as he recollects those days of steam when there were rails across the moor. But the mornings, on the 7.35, it was a small club of commuters which met, with occasional guest members out for a day's shopping in Plymouth or Tavy. Clerks, pupils, warders' wives, all fitted into one coach, with corner seats for most of us. There was a second coach in the set, taken for an airing on Saturdays, or some of those special days like Tavistock Goosey Fair and for the bank holiday crowds which came pouring up from Plymouth in torrents of uh, 10, 12? Some mornings there'd be two men standing aloof from the rest of us. One would be a prison officer, looking like someone you thought you knew in civvy clothes. Escort this morning for the time-served man, seeing him off the premises as far as the station. And for us, it was always the rule to leave him and his compartment strictly alone, out of compassion, to give him time to take it all in, the windows without bars, the light off the moor. Of the two crews, Bill Goff was the one with features like the Tours and a Cockney accent, but never a sigh for old Smokey. Before the run down to Yelverton, he'd leave his fireman in charge of the cab for a quick roll call or ball encouragement to stragglers late on the station path. There'd be the train, blanketed in steam, Bill wrapped in it, at home in it, a kind of great western barbecue, and Bill's voice thundering out of it like the one which rolled over Sarnii. But he never lost a customer, though his patience ran out once. I arrived that morning to see the tail lamp disappearing past the signal box but the watchful signalman waggled the distant up and down, a semaphore for, uh, did you leave something? And back came the train for the lost sheep. Well, the Great Western had a reputation for personal service, and it was a service, one which touched the lives of everyone on the moor, shops, villages, the school, those occasional tourists. Prisoners came in by rail, their families on visiting days, and the wartime evacuation of the Isle of Wight prison saw lines of manacled men in the most unique special up the branch. Foodstuffs, papers, the mails, the railway was the vital link, for buses only dared to tackle those hills from Tavistock via Merivale on three days of the week, twice a day, long before mass motoring that is, and even when that came, Four men in a Ford never made a club. The settlers, bound to the walls of the prison as closely as the prisoners inside, planned their lives on railway time. You depended on it for bringing your own relatives up for a day, or making your own break from the moor. It was safe, it was regular and sure. Even when the first gales threatened snow, with the engine still on shed, from the station at 7.30, lying beneath lead and copper. Princetown could be cut off overnight. Freight, not passengers, was the main concern, particularly fuel and foodstuffs for moorland cattle. The plough worked day and night to keep the line open above Dowson. The blizzard of March 1891 buried this train beyond Peak Hill, with six passengers aboard, 
Next day, a party of railmen fought their way out from Dowsland with provisions, but failed to persuade them to return with them on foot. So a second night passed, entombed in the train, until a local sheep farmer led them to his cottage, where they remained until they and the engine were dug free. Eight days since it had left Princeton. In 1947, the Navy came to the rescue, but not before the pupils of the grammar school had been shanghaied at Yelverton, pirated out by bus, till that took fright on the Arctic slopes of Peak Hill, and turned back to Yelverton, where everyone was stowed away in a coal hotel at the company's expense. But there was always springtime and the thaw. Sunday was a day of rest for the railway, all very proper after the high spot of the week, for Saturday was high holiday, circus day, VE day, the day of the two coach run. For prison officers, it meant putting on civvies. For their wives, putting on the writs in war-battered Plymouth. It was the day for shopping, pasties on the whole, Argyle, or the pictures, but never both, because it all ended at six o'clock, just as the lights came on, giving you a sense of being packed off to bed just as the party began. But for more bound folk, the Saturday railway was the way to get the granite off your back.
Dartmoor is now almost void of railway traffic, although passenger trains are again running from Exeter to Oakhampton in the summer months, packed with railway buffs. This section of line once extended into Tavistock, and the Southern Region line with its expresses thundered through the verges of the moor. From Plymouth, the train rattled on through to Beer Alston, Tavistock North, Brentor, Bridistow and Oakhampton on its way to Exeter Central. The main thrust of the line ceased to operate in 1968. Another much-loved and missed branch line that crossed the Great National Park of Dartmoor was that from Newton Abbott to Morton Hampstead, opened by the South Devon Railway on the 4th of July 1896. Intermediate stations included Heathfield and Bobby Tracy, but like other branch lines targeted by those balance sheet deficits, it closed to passenger traffic in 1959. This unique archive footage, captured by Graham Bully, chronicles that sad day when one of the last passenger trains made its final journey from Newton Abbott to Morton Hampstead, thus closing another milestone in railway history. But there is a happy finale to this story. One of the engines, a 45-class tank that used to run on the Yelverton to Princetown branch, has been adopted by the Paynton and Dartmouth Railway Company on their preserve line and is earning more money for its owners now than it ever did under British Rail. <laughs> <laughs>